My name is Tyler Frey, you may remember me from uh, last time. Um, I'm a student here at the University of Toledo. My mentors are Tom McGath and uh, Tom Allen. And the title of my talk is Measuring Accretion Rates of Protoplanetary Disks Around Young Stars in Cepheus OB 3B. Um, and just reading the title, I may have lost the attention of half the room. So uh, I want to talk about the purpose of this research, which is to um, gain a better understanding of uh, something or a topic that might be a little bit more interesting sounding, which is uh, how do solar systems form? Um, how does a big cloud of gas and dust and ice uh, turn into a star with planets and other objects orbiting around it? Um, so to understand this entire process, uh, we first need to understand the little processes that uh, make up this entire process here. So, um, uh, so that's why we're studying um, the uh, protoplanetary disks around uh, pre-main sequence stars, which is uh, this step here. Um, so, or more specifically, we're studying the accretion rates of those protoplanetary disks. So. Um, uh, Protoplanetary disk, uh, in the most general sense, is just the material that's left over after a young star is formed. It orbits around the star. So this is an artist's depiction of it. Um, that's not a real picture of what a protoplanetary disk looks like. So you can see here, uh, material is actually falling into that star. So that's the accretion process there. That's what we're uh, interested in. There's a better look at it. So over time, these uh, disks uh, dissipate for a number of reasons, uh, far more than I could list here. Um, some of the factors are photo evaporation from UV and X-ray radiation, um, planetary formation, uh, close flybys if they're in a dense enough cluster, and then the last one here is magnetospheric accretion, which is what we're researching here, that's what we're looking at. Um, so this is another artist's depiction that's not an actual picture. Um, this is what uh, this process might look like if you could see uh, the magnetic field lines, which are these things here. Um, so the material in this disk is close enough to the star that it's um, ionized and it, it has a charge. Um, so when it comes into contact with these magnetic field lines, it uh, is channeled into the source. And then when it comes into contact with the photosphere of that star, um, it's what's called shock heated, which causes an emission of light in the ultraviolet. So uh, young stars that are um, actively accreting material give off an excess amount of ultraviolet light. Um, and this is a sample uh, spectrum chart here of a young star. Uh, this solid line here is the uh, model. Um, and you can see from this over is the ultraviolet light. So you can see an excess of ultraviolet light. Um, and we can actually detect that light and use that to help us estimate the accretion rate of that star if we know the mass and radius. Um, which we do for the stars we're looking at. So this is how we determine the uh, uh, actual amount of excess ultraviolet light. Um, we take the U minus I color of the object and subtract from that the U minus I color, what we would expect that object to be if it were not actively creating material. Um, so we use class three stars in the field. Class three stars are um, objects that aren't creating material. So um, this is just a sample chart from another region of the temperature and color of a class three object. So then we can use that um, excess ultraviolet light to um, figure out the luminosity in the ultraviolet spectrum. And we can use that as a proxy to determine the luminosity uh, of the star just due to the uh, material it's secreting uh, from this top equation. And then we can plug that into this bottom equation here along with the radius and mass uh, and the gravitational constant, which gives us that accretion rate in uh, solar masses per year. So this is sort of the main goal of our research. Um, we're going to do this for uh, all the objects in the field we're looking at, which, as I said before, was Cepheus OB 3B. Um, so that's what I want to talk about now, why Cepheus OB 3B. Um, why did Tom go out to the Discovery Channel Telescope to collect data? Um, as you can see, it's one of the largest nearby young clusters with roughly 3,000 members. Uh, it's 700 parsecs away, or roughly 2,300 light years, if you're more familiar with that unit of distance. Um, but it just so happens that there are clusters that are closer and clusters with more members. So what makes this one so special? Um, 
as Tom put it earlier, it's kind of the Goldilocks uh, cluster with uh, not too many members, not uh, too few. It's close enough, or it's not too close, it's not too far away, and the, all the members seem to be at the right age for the research we're conducting. So that's why uh, this was chosen. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture of the research. Um, so now I kind of want to talk about the science behind the science. Um, what I've been actually working on, what I've been doing for the last few months. Um, so just a quick recap. Uh, last time I talked about reducing DCT data um, using this equation, um, solving for i to get the usable data, and we treat the images like an array of numbers. Um, so we subtract a bias frame from the signal, which um, is the bias frame is just the uh, intrinsic, intrinsic signal from the detector, and we want to get rid of that, and then we divide out a flat field to uh, sort of normalize the image. Um, so after we do that, we're left with the intensity. So it takes us from an image like this to an image over there. You can kind of see noisy, grainy stuff going on. Um, well, you can kind of see it there too, but I think that's just because the picture is so big. But yeah, we get rid of this stuff that we don't want in here, um, in that image there. So um, this is kind of where I ended up last time, so uh, I'll just continue from there. Um, I should mention that this is just one uh, dither or image in one filter or band of light. Um, so this is ultraviolet light here. This is what the field looks like um, in ultraviolet. So now I'm going to talk about those two words I just said, um, filters and dithers. Um, so three filters were used on the imager. Um, and filters only allow a certain wavelength of light through. So I-band filter allows infrared light, B-band for blue light, and U-band for ultraviolet light. And then for each filter, there's um, <laughs> Tom took five um, dithers, which is just a fancy way of saying offset image. Um, you take a central image and you take four offset images around there. Um, and the reason you do that is to uh, decrease the contribution from bad pixels or scratches that might be on the imager. Um, if you just took one image and there's a scratch, uh, anything behind that would be undetectable. So um, that's why dithers are taken. So uh, five dithers, three filters, you, we end up with 15 images total. Um, so then from there, um, we want to combine the dithers into one large image. Um, and the way we do that, we put uh, WCS information into the image, which WCS is World Coordinate System, which is basically just um, like latitude and longitude projected outwards. Um, so then we line, up, we line up those images based on that information. So then we go from 15 images to three large mosaic images, one for each band. So this is what the infrared band looks like, uh, blue light and ultraviolet light. Okay, so after we uh, mosaic the images, we want to create a false color image um, based on the wavelength. Um, so we can kind of see what uh, these stars look like, what their color is. Um, so usually when you're working with three filters, you assign the longest wavelength um, red and then the shortest blue, and then the middle one is green, so that's why even though B-band is blue light, it's actually colored blue in the, this purpose. So if it was the shortest wavelength, we would color it blue, but it's not, so that's why. So then, um, we, so this is what the three mosaics stack on top of each other and then color. This is what uh, it looks like. You can make out some color in there. It's not the brightest, but... Um, so this is what I've done to this point. Um, from here, I'm going to use the data from each band to uh, determine the excess ultraviolet light coming from these objects, um, and then use that to determine the accretion rate eventually. So that's it. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. That might be Tom. Might be able to go back to your pretty, your, your, your pretty picture of uh, the magnetic field lines and the accretion disk. Oh. So since the accretion disk is rotating, there's going to be magnetic field lines touching each other and reconnecting 
which produces a lot of energy, like in the sun, and that's going to create UV radiation. How do you distinguish the UV radiation from the accretion process versus the star versus the reconnection process? Yeah, I think you can better off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for just just say the the reconnection process is on the stars, um, we'll get that sort of the, the U minus I color of the class threes. So we're, we're going to look at the class twos and the class three separ separately. And for a given spectral type, assume the class three color is the photospheric color. Um, if there's a, a, a sort of a, one of the lines connecting the star and the disk, and that's you know, reconnecting with another line. I'm not sure how we could initially differentiate this. This is sort of part of a, a long time series project. So we're gonna have um, multiple epochs. So I guess if we had this really bright excess source in one epoch and nothing else, it's probably a flare. But those, those flares are gonna be very short-lived. Um, so we, the odds of us catching one. Have, have these objects been um monitored with XMM or some other? Uh, yeah, we have uh, Chandra observations of this region. Okay, so that's another way of... Yeah, but they're, unfortunately they're not. You know, the Chandra observations are from six years ago. Yeah, but at least it'll give you an indication of potential flaring objects. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so we we know of some objects that have had you know, major flares, as you mentioned, which probably are the star disk fields, the star disk lines. Got a follow up, <laughs> but another one for you too. But um, I assume the star is not rotating at the Keplerian orbit speed of where those field lines are penetrating the disk. At, at unless that point, they're co-rotating yeah, because of that angular momentum. At that point, they are co-rotating because because the the star and the disk are coupled. Um, the star is going to become tidal and locked. Uh, it's going to become locked to the disk through the magnetic field lines. So uh, the disk actually regulates the rotation of the star. And, and there's a, a nice paper out um, today that actually, um, they look at um, the angular momentum of the stars with and without disk. And once the star doesn't have this disk, its angular momentum changes. It, it rapidly spins up. Okay. So my other question goes back to the old last pretty picture, which is informative picture of the art of education. <laughs> that's, what, yeah, that's very nice. Um, can you identify which of those stars are in this association right now, just so we can get a picture of what's a background object and what's in this association? Um, well, we were kind of talking about that earlier, and it might be um, too early to kind of tell. Are all the bright objects like oh, to be? We can. We can. We, we can. <laughs> um, that was uh, part of my thesis research. The first step was characterizing these sources, determining based on Spitzer accesses which have disks, using Chandra to see which ones are the class threes that don't. So we have a, a good census of the members of this region. So it was, I mean, which is which? Uh, so was that bright story, it's about 27086? No, no. Um, these are, so. Just for reference, for those who have seen, there's a I, actually. Here. Can you go back to the? Sorry, should I even get up? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll show you where it is in the field. If you go back to the title slide. So okay, so this is um, HD086. You know what I'm trying to talk about. I forget the name of it. These are the two star, two bright stars in the region. So our field is kind of right here that we're looking at. And, what, and all of the and so the mainly bright stars that are in that field are members of the association. So yes, yes. Um, the, especially these. Those two, the two up above. These two, those two. Yeah, these are two of the early B stars. That's right, early B. Maybe. Um, so those B. are those are blue because they're early B, or are they blue because they're got excess ultraviolet? The, the two big ones, those are because they're rotor-type stars. <coughs> they're, they're, at this point, they're uh, zero imaging sequence. Okay. Um, so you're looking for UV excess 
Dust loves eating UV photons. Do you have a plan for um, getting rid of extinction as part of like determining the UV excess or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't made it that far. Okay. Yet, okay. So, uh, cool. I'm assuming we do. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> This is this is pretty much the last thing I've done. Yeah. So this is where I'm at. That'll be maybe your next head. Yeah, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. that. That's what the B band data is for. So if you use a B minus I colors, okay. try to make the extinction. Yeah. Okay. So B minus I for extinction, and then you. Then U minus B. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Oh, no, sorry. I'm U, U minus I actually for the excess. Okay. Right. So those uh, very red faint stars might be just background stars that have been highly red. They could be the yeah, I, mean, I have to mess around with the scaling a little bit with them, so, yeah. I mean, you can see some blue artifacts in here, too, which shouldn't be there. So it's not it's not perfect. I'm still messing with it right now, so. But there is blue nebulosity. Well, that brings up a question about your data reduction process. What are what specifically are you using to reduce this data? Did you write your own program? Or? Yeah, and, uh, IDL. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious to take a look at that because I'm actually okay. also doing DCT data reduction and okay. yeah. um, I'd like to compare okay. what we're doing because uh, you do see some artifacts that might be able to, through the data reduction process, mm -hmm. you might be able to get rid of that. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I could go back and mask out these um, pixels too. They might be cosmic rays or something I can get rid of. So. Yeah, in your equation, you talk about the flat field. Yeah. So you're dividing by that. Yep. Over the years, I've been sitting here long enough to pick up a couple things. But uh, <laughs> could you uh, could you describe what what you mean by flat field? Um, it's how you collect it, or what it what it what, it what, what are you dividing out? Um, or what is that number? It's just a way to normalize um, the image um, to account for the atmosphere, or what it just the difference in the Pixels, uh, the way the the photons are detected in the pixels. And how do you determine that? <clears throat> What's that? How do you determine that? Determine the the flat field. Um, the, number, well, the, the nature of the values that you use. Well, this is a separate image that was taken. Um, but it's just uh, uh, like a short exposure image against a uh, flat field, basically uh, the dome when it's closed or. Okay. So uh, it's a local. Yeah. Yeah. Sky. <laughs> yeah. I think I actually use this uh, sky image for this one. So. Yeah. We we do both dome flats as well as sky twilight flats. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have both to choose from each other. So can you remove the nebulosity just by looking at the adjacent pixels to the stars and subtracting out the uh, nebulosity? Uh, well, yeah. When when we actually start taking aperture photometry, what we're going to do is you know lay down an aperture around the star, and then lay down sort of a background aperture. Um, so we can use a background aperture to subtract the background. All right. Well, let's thank Tyler and Dave. And uh, 